Do you know what? I was doing some research on different types, different uses for all these casks. Yeah. Right. Obviously, we've got the famous Niagara Falls barrel. Right. We, we tried to find out whether or not that was actually a whiskey barrel, didn't we? There was, I mean, there's a number of people, and we couldn't find one that was directly to the was, spirits industry. It was, it was, yeah, we tr it, we tried hard to try and link. It was a barrel. It was a barrel. It was a barrel. It was, barrel, it was definitely a barrel. Definitely yeah. a barrel. Definitely a barrel. Otherwise, whoever jumped, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't have. <laughs> you'd assume anyway. whoever jumped over Niagara Falls in a barrel had just recently drank the entire yeah. contents of that barrel. Did you did you also agree that to um? To test out uh, the safety of it, she uh, she put a cat in a barrel first. For right, she did bring back, and it didn't survive, did it? I think it did it. I think it survived because I think that was, uh, that was reason uh, for that going was over the edge. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. The what, cat what? died. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And welcome to uh, the latest Brayburn Whiskey Podcast. It's been a while. Um, I have a new co-host, um, Mihai. Welcome, Mihai. Thank you, Jacob. To, Thank uh, you. To working together with you in the future. We're going to talk about casks today, aren't we? I hope so. Yes, barrels. Barrels yeah. and, their, and, their, and their importance to the whiskey industry. Billy did, before we start, pick us out a nice little anecdote to share with you, um, which highlights how weird some of the, uh, the, uh, the the uses of cast can be. Um, so in 1852, uh, a salesman by the name of George Henderson travelled by ship from Scotland to Australia, okay. uh, carrying a cask of Scotch whisky with him, which he planned on promoting in Australia. Um, however, there was uh, a storm, and unfortunately, George's cask of whisky was uh, washed over the ship's deck. And it turned up, I don't know how long, we didn't actually in the story get, we don't know how long it was in the sea for before it turned up on the shores of Tasmania um, and was found by a fisherman who, to his surprise, found that the cask still had whiskey in it. News of this sea-matured Scotch whiskey quickly spread through uh, through Australia. And what, became... what kind of whiskey? Sea-matured. 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 Which is a thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. Sea-matured Scotch whiskey. Do you know what they called it? <laughs> no idea. So this guy was called George Henderson. So they called this whiskey, this sea-matured whiskey, Henderson's Sea Pie. Who knows? Um, anyway, um, it was uh, tasted by experts at the Melbourne Exhibition in 1854 and uh, I won a prize. I don't know what the prize okay. was. Um, not a particularly glamorous story, but what it does highlight is uh, the adaptability of the Scottish whisky producers and the whisky industry and, uh, and creative marketing strategies that we still mm. see today from some of our uh, revered blue ship distilleries such as Macallan have these really unusual, uh, unusual bottlings. So anyway, that's the anecdote <laughs> out of the way. Um, Tell us, Mihai, why are whiskey casks or why are casks so important to the whiskey industry? There's a lot of reasons for that, Jacob. The most obvious one is the law, essentially, yeah. regulation. What is the law? Um, whiskey needs to be matured in oak, okay? Whether that's American oak, whether that's European oak, it needs to be matured in oak, okay? It needs to be matured for at least three years to be called single malt. Um, in America, for example, bourbon needs to be mature for at least two years. Two years. Slightly different, but again, the importance there is the law, is the regulation. <laughs> Essentially, you can't get around it. Um, the, the more obvious or the most, um, the, the, the biggest reason that we're accustomed to and we see it every time we, we essentially drink uh, a dram is the impact that it has on the whiskey. Okay, whiskey is a white spirit when it gets distilled, but really takes all of its characteristics. I was reading something along the lines of 60 to 75% of the whiskey character comes from comes the wood. From, which comes is from why, wood. well, you probably hear, I, yeah. I was going to call them arrogant, arrogant then, but that would be wrong. But you hear a, a lot of coopers that will tell you that um, they're responsible for the character of the whiskey that we drink, which uh, I give it in some, 60, yeah. 
percent plus of the character of the whiskey determined by the cask. They, they seem to have a in some shape or form, exactly. Yeah, um, it it impacts the whiskey in in a lot of ways. Um, traditionally or typically, that maturation process is impacted by a lot of factors, by the location of the cask, by the size of the cask, by the longevity, but by the reuse. Um, of the cast, how many times it's actually been used, how many type of liquids it's had inside. Um, but when it comes to whiskey, it's been, it's, it, it impacts the maturation in a threefold manner. Okay. So it, is it fair to say then that without the, uh, the use of oak casts in the production of whiskey, we'd be drinking something completely different? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you'd be, you'd be drinking essentially I don't know something else like like a moonshine or, or something I, along I, those lines. Like Wavite, is that right? That was obviously where whiskey comes yeah. from as well. Um, and we use a lot of casks from the bourbon industry. Absolutely, yeah. Bourbon industry is actually the biggest supplier, as such, of casks for the Scotch industry. Um, and the reason for that, have, have you looked into it? I, yeah, I, I do know a little about it, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to sort of uh, listen to your explanation. I mean, what I understand, obviously, is, and I'm sure quite a few people, is that the bourbon industry is a, a is forced, so the regulation requires that they only use that cast once. And you were telling Billy and I an yeah. interesting story, interesting story. about how, that, uh, how it, they came about to use their cast once. Absolutely. So the, 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 the history with bourbon is a little bit special. So essentially... Um, this guy called Reverend Elia Craig. Okay, he's got a strong name. <laughs> um, back in the the late seventies, um, Elijah, 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 Elia, Elijah. <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? I would assume so. Yeah. Elijah, Elijah. Which is, it always was sort of. Um, I think of um, Elijah. Sort of. <laughs> I'm thinking of it. <laughs> yeah, I think of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You anyways, all... anyways. Sorry. El Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, Elijah Craig. Um, Elijah Craig. Reverend back in the 70s. He was essentially producing and distilling a lot of moonshine. Gotcha. What, what was back then moonshine, great, right? The Reverend Elijah and was producing moonshine. Exactly. He was having the time of his life. And he had essentially an excess of this liquid. And this is the story with a lot of liquids. They essentially needed to store yeah. that, that, that liquid somewhere. And he put it into oak barrels. And what's happened is after a few months, after a few years, he started dipping into it. And he tasted the completely, like the, the character of the, 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 the liquid. It wasn't called whiskey. It was completely different, completely different. right? And they used um, only new oak virgin oak okay um and essentially the reason for that started being as a case of you know having an abundance so they they had the luxury of essentially using the, the cask just, just for the one for, for for a one-way trip essentially right? right so they were they were putting those casks down the mississippi river when they got to tennessee they were picking them up empty casks filling them with what was then or what would become bourbon and then it was essentially much more cost efficient to just, to just like scrape them yeah rather than sailing them up the the, the river or uh, different methods of transportation this we're talking about the late 1700s beginning of 1800s it's right it was a massive issue it wasn't a massive yeah. issue and they had a lot of wood yeah right which is Slightly different case scenario in, in today's a lot of work, in, in today's world, <laughs> um, but but that's why that's okay. why they well, were that, they were only used so, for one. And, and now, as you, and, and we can see how this translates now, when when sort of regulation is brought in, and and obviously to maintain some sort of consistency in the production of bourbon, using the cast once became law. It became law. It became heritage. Um, it became a really big industry and what's happening now essentially you've got all of these associations and all of these uh, parties that, that work in the um, lumber industry, they fight for their job yeah. because the, 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 the conversations now are all around sustainability. How much more can we actually or how much more sustainable can we make this industry and is it sustainable the way we're doing it now just to use the cast once? 
quite an exciting development. <laughs> Sorry, I'm staggering a little bit. So what I did, <laughs> what I did, because I watched South Park recently, um, I, I, I spoke to the artificial person on, is it CGP chat, do they call it? GPT. GBT, Artificial Chat GBT. No, it's chat, what do they call it? <laughs> yeah, that one. So I asked the question, because just to put this into some sort of context, there was a rumour going around. It appears after extensive research, it was nothing but a rumour. But there was a rumour that the, bur the laws on producing bourbon may well change. And um, in an effort to be a bit more sustainable, as we just said, they might use their casks more than once. More than once, yeah. Uh, which would mean they would carry out this process that we call shaving, toasting, and the charring, charring, STC. So we said, if bourbon producers use their barrels, this is, uh, I'm quoting an artificial person here. If bourbon producers use their barrels more than once, there will be fewer barrels available for Scotch producers to use. This is what we figured. Mm -hmm. This can have several effects on the Scotch, on Scotch whiskey production. Increased competition for barrels. We're seeing that now. You know, that that's a thing already in our industry. And we talked about earlier the fact that um, it's one of the things that is restricting the amount of whiskey that can be produced because exactly. the, they, there's not enough vessels, there's not enough oak cask there to put this whiskey into mature. The distillery can just produce millions, millions of litres, but if they don't have anywhere to put them, they're limited. Well, yeah, exactly. That's where we exactly. are. Exactly. So as bourbon producers start to reuse their barrels, there'll be increased competition for the remaining barrels, obviously... The net impact of that is push the flavor up, push the flavor up, push the price up. Um, but this was really, this is this is sort of, again, I'm going to read this verbatim from Artificial Person. Changes in flavor profile. The use of previously used bourbon barrels can have a significant impact on the flavor profile of Scotch whiskey. And we know this, we talk about vanillas coming from bourbon specifically. If fewer bourbon barrels are available for Scotch producers to use, they may have to turn to other types of barrels, mm -hmm. which could then change the taste of the final product. Well, we know that to be a fact. Um, reduce consistency, which is a little bit of a, uh, alarming. Again, I will we'll touch on this, but I think the industry is addressing um, problems we've got with wood supply. Um, Scotch producers rely on a consistent aging process to ensure that their product maintains its quality and flavor profile. If Scotch producers are forced to use different types of barrels or aging processes because of lack of bourbon barrels, this could lead to inconsistencies in the final product. Now that is obviously yeah. a concern. Um, overall, the availability of used bourbon barrels can have a significant impact on the Scotch whiskey industry and any changes in the availability of these barrels can have ripple effects through the industry. So there you go. No need for us. We just next chat so, We'll just chat, put something in chat, CBGT, and uh, <laughs> you'll have all the answers. We have bourbon. That it is fair to say is the most commonly used cask in our industry. Yeah. Um, again, sort of talking specifically about the wood, and and you know, okay, fantastic. So you put some whiskey in in, a, in a, an oak barrel, and you come back to it a number of years later. And it's this wonderful spirit that we can all enjoy. But why is that? We talk about shaving, toasting, and charring. This is a process used to prepare a cask for maturation. So the, sh yeah. the shaving is removing the, fur the inside layer of the cask, subsequently toast that cask, that cask, that toasting changes the, uh, the, the structure of the wood. We get the sugars out that we want. Different levels of toasting. Um, and then the charring, which is produces the carbon, which is involved in the extractive part of the whiskey maturation. So just to demonstrate how complex this area is, I'm going to read you one small passage from uh, uh, some of the research that I was doing. Um, the amount or level of charring is a further parameter that can be tweaked to influence whiskey maturation. Charring is critical to whiskey maturation it promotes fast lignin breakdown and caramelization of the hemicellulose, obviously, thus extracting considerably more guayacols, um, isoeugenol, and vanillin into the spirit. Now, I know what vanillin is. <laughs> what are the rest? <laughs> so, and, 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 and again, whilst we're on that subject, um, Diageo now, they, they, they announced this recently, 
that they have teamed up with scientists from the Harriet Watt University in Scotland and to investigate how whiskey gets its flavor, its flavor from cask, cask maturation. And according to Diageo, um, no one, not even us, has been able to pin down scientifically the magic that happens inside the mm. cask. So this is magic. And we'll get to that magic phase in a second, but um, perhaps you could tell us then about the various sort of Absolutely. interactions that are occurring with the water and the spirit. The three before four, specifically. Before we go to the magic, there are two. Well, actually, maturation happens in threefold. Three ways that the wood impacts the liquid inside the cask. And you've got the additive way. The additive way is essentially what's the components that the wood brings to the liquid, okay? So that's your flavor, that's your color. You've got the subtractive, okay? So the wood not only gives, but also takes away. We know the famous and loved or hated angel share. Um, there's an element of evaporation, but there's also an element of purification. Yes. Um, so that's the, really important, yeah. The, the subtractive way that the, the, the liquid interacts with the wood is essentially eliminating some of, eliminating some of those impurities. For example, sulfites. Yeah. It takes that away, which is not something as pleasant to smell or drink. Uh, well, so just, uh, that is um, a debatable. Uh, you know, there are, and, and it is, I know exactly where you're coming from because, you know, the use of, we're going to talk about the sherry cast, pre-sulfurs, mm -hmm. and it was this idea that sulfides or or the, the, the word is sulfur spoiling or sulfur tainting was um, contributed towards a, 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 a less refined or an inferior mm -hmm. whiskey. And yet you can cross the room and, they'll, and, and then sort of a group of connoisseurs and experts will tell you that's a wonderful element of the whiskey. So that, yeah. that's taste, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah I know, it, absolutely. It's a matter of person. But... Um, you know, we get sulfur from the copper as well, as well as yeah. just the casks. And sometimes that's, you know, they, this is why some spirits benefit from additional aging because there are some sulfides that come from the copper, for example. Exactly. But you, you said something there that's quite interesting because we, we, we quite often we look at evaporation mm -hmm. of uh, as just basically one of the downsides of this whole process. You know, we're ultimately losing some of the liquid. But as you just quite, quite rightly said, actually that evaporation... It's some important. The stuff that's evaporating is exactly it's, what we don't want to be drinking. Exactly. Yeah. It's very, very important. And that's why a lot of times, for example, when you have distilleries and, and um, cooper, or not cooperages, but warehouses where they change the, 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 the cask, they do re rackings into sherry bombs or peat bombs or quarter casks, but they don't give it enough time to actually give the chance for that subtractive. subtractive element or process to take place they only have the first additive process and then the third one which is the um, interactive process i'm going to touch on that in a second but the importance of all of this is to have all three because if you eliminate or you skip the subtractive uh, process then you're essentially it was hot yeah you, you've got something there and in a sense unfinished yeah uh, and and, it, and and it's it's interesting because they talk about this with um you know, they, we talk about the volume of liquid that's exposed to the wood. So, you know, if you have a smaller cask, there's a higher percentage of that liquid yeah. is in contact with the wood. So doing, and, and a lot of distilleries have adopted this. So using smaller casks to, to mature, you can accelerate the maturation process. But unfortunately, the subtractive you lose some of the process part, yeah. takes longer. So you do need to give the whiskey years so you can... You know, you might be able to sort of speed up the process and, and get more of these compounds into the whiskey that looks like a great color. Um, and you get some of the flavors associated with the cast. You get all of that, but without that subtractive element, exactly. the evaporation, you're still going to get some of these compounds. That what, what do we always... Rough. We oh. always, always, always tell our investors whiskey is a patience game. Yeah, yeah. That's key. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's key. Absolutely. Should I touch on the third? The interact... Well, that's the most important. And, and you said it yourself, this is the magic part. Certain chemicals and molecular reactions occur between the wood, the spirit, the residuals left by the previous fillings, and most importantly, oxygen to create new flavors and aromas. So the casks breathe 
the mm-hmm. spirit oxidizes and the oak and the spirit transform one another and that's pretty important because it's just so complicated because that transformation is going on the oak is changing as well and it's imparting some different compounds onto the whiskey it, it, i mean it's <laughs> and then apart from that then you're talking about first fills, second fills, we, refills. We will come to that. We will come to that. Yeah, and it's important. So, again, this interactive process can be where the different oak species, which we've not talked about, you know, European oak, a lot of people assume, for example, that sherry automatically means European oak. Well, that's not true. In fact, the majority of sherry casts, believe it or not, are in American oak. So, mm-hmm. and, then, and, and people will talk about, and this is just, there isn't, again, one thing that became apparent to me is that our industry still has plenty to learn about the casks, the wood, and this process, which is great because if that is the case, then we can only expect whiskies and the characters' yeah. whiskies to improve. Um, but again, you know, talking about the different types of oats, permeability, the different compounds, vanilla comes from American oak, you know, um, the um, European is more porous. You've got Mizanara, Japanese oak. You know, you use Japanese oak, and they, I think it takes you 200 years. 200 years, yeah. 200 years, you'll get one cask out of it, and it'll probably leak all over the floor. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot There's a lot to consider when you're making cask choices. Um, different oak species produce different results as they vary in the nature of their chemical and biological makeup, the differing characteristics of the wood's density, permeability, Mm -hmm. hemicellulose. Now, I'm going to to chance my arm here, and I think the hemicellulose is actually the top layer, and it's quite... When they char the wood, sorry, when they toast the wood, you'll see a change. If you get a cross-section of the wood, you'll see that chemical change is actually um, reflected in a different tone to the wood. And I think, now somebody's going to correct me, I'm sure, that that may well be something to do with hemicellulose. Anyway, lignins, tannins, oils, lipids, and so on. So there are more of them. Um, will all impact the spirit difference, differently. Despite the modern Scotch whiskey industry being more than 250 years old, commentators and industry professionals, such as Bull Limsden mm-hmm. uh, of Glenmorangie, believe that this third interactive process is only just now starting to be understood from a scientific perspective. And again, we come back to what Diageo are doing. What we always say is, is it's not an exact science, right? And that's, I mean, that's proof, proof there. Um, wild. We're it's still wild. trying to understand everything and we're not the only ones. It's really exciting. Uh, you know, there, there are changes. I mean, it's, we, um, it's this greater requirement now for sustainability. The whiskey industry actually has a really good record on that. They set mm-hmm. targets by the British government. Uh, and my understanding is that we're already sort of four or five years ahead of of schedule. So the industry is trying; it's doing a good job. And I think wood is one of these areas that uh, that we're going to have to look at in the future. And I am aware already in Scotland there are, and, and in Europe there are now sustainable oak programs. But you know, I always how long do you have to wait before it's exactly. available? So as you'd expect, the different oaks impart different characteristics and flavors to the uh, to the spirits that they mature. Mm-hmm. American oak, which is rich in vanillin, typically imparts a sweeter uh, note with flavors that fall into vanilla, coconut, and uh, sort of tropical fruit family. European oak, which is, this is, again, this is why our industry needs to get a sounder understanding of the wood that we work with. European oak, often referred to as Spanish oak in the whiskey industry, um, imparts characteristics that are typically drier, spicier, including dried fruit, cinnamon, citrus. And then you've got French oak, which mm-hmm. I'm assuming is from Europe as well, um, so. uh, which combines an unusual mix of both savory and sweet. Um, and then, just, you, know, you know, people talking about common descriptors, tobacco, uh, cedar, yep. nuttiness, coffee, and chocolate. So... That's that's without any consideration for what the the cast was previously used for. Just the wood itself is going to make a, such a significant difference to the character of of the whiskey. Absolutely, and then you know we, we were talking earlier about all of these casts. They're they're still used, you know, in in the industry as a as a vast majority or a vast variety of options, but still the most. 
commonly used and the most important one is the ex-bourbon casks. Absolutely. Right? But apart from that, we've also got the sherry casks. Sherry. The sherry casks. Sherry brings something completely different to the table. Absolutely. So there's nine municipalities, including vineyards of Trebojena, Lebrija, Chipiona, Rota, Chiclana de la Frontera, y Puerto Real, as well as the three um, production zones, which is the Dio de Jerez. And there are new laws. So, and, and just very, so nobody gets alarmed at all. It doesn't impact anything that's currently maturing. Mm -hmm. But there's been, you know, there's sort of, there's questions about whether, and it's, you know, as is the case with a lot of regions, they're just protecting the provenance of their casts and of their product. But it would appear that some casts perhaps they might come from the sherry region, but actually the production of that wine that they pre didn't use the grapes associated with sherry specifically. So it's a little bit loose, let's say. And um, and Spain has changed its laws; it wants to tighten up on that. And it's and great because provenance is what you know. The That's what you want, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So in January, the the Spanish government implemented new regulations that affect the use of sherry casks in our industry. Um, the regulations require that sherry casks used for the Asian Scott whiskey must be labelled as sherry in Spain before they can be exported to mm -hmm. other countries for use, for example, in the whiskey industry. Um, that's caused a few concerns because it may potentially limit the availability of sherry casks for use in, in Scottish whiskey. What does that I, mean? Another limiting factor. So, <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, prices. Yeah, pricing uh, yeah, just becomes... Yeah. That much more. Expensive. This seems to be the, the 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 repeating conversation or the repeating factor that we're having every time we're talking about anything that's happening in the industry. It just results in being yeah. a bit more expensive. <laughs> what is interesting about this um, this new regulation is what we, how it's actually going to impact the profile of whiskies in the future, and you know, whether or not we as consumers are actually going to be able to you know detect the difference. Um, if there is a difference, I'd be hopeful and pretty confident it's going to be a positive one. Um, but, you know, the, I, the Spanish sherry, what do we associate it with? This really distinct profile, dried fruits, nuts, spice, Christmas pudding, etc., etc. And if the availability of these casts become limited, um, then producers are going to be turning and, and are doing now um, yeah. two different types of casks um you saw that with glenfiddich very very recently when they released their orchard um i think it's called glenfiddich orchard release where they essentially used casks as an ex experiment from apple cider uh, maturation now there's because of what's happening because it's just scarce cider and whiskey all in one drink. I'm actually not stuff it. dreams of me. You get it from the office. Yeah, totally. Try that. Um, but there, there's a lot more types of casts being used in the industry as a almost as a necessity or as a form of exploration because you're now starting to struggle, starting to pay a lot more for your sherry casks, for your bourbon casks. So you're looking at alternatives. And that's ex beer casks, ex cider casks, ex rum casks, ex wine casks as well. And you're now seeing those being used more and more. Where yeah. is that going to go, and and how many options or how the industry is going to change? Don't know. See, don't worry. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, and it's interesting because when we talk about sherry casks, there's still this belief that uh, every cask that's seasoned in some sort of wine as being used for the production and subsequent maturation of that spirit. Sherry, very specifically, you know, we know that the sherry industry uses Solero system. Some of yes. these casts have been in the Solero system for hundreds you know, of years. Hundreds of yeah. years. They're not just going to pull they, them they out. They take them out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this idea, and this is why I think in the past people have been a little bit sort of coy about the, the sort of uh, the provenance of their sherry casts because the truth is, that your whiskey that's matured in a sherry cask, that cask was not used for the production of sherry. It's sherry seasoned. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we, we were down there, we spent some time with them. They sort of season, dry the wood for 18 months. 18 months, yeah. Um, they're usually the 500 liters or 200 liters uh, 
butts and barrels. Butts, yeah. And um, typically manufactured to order. We know this because we've asked them to do uh, to do some for us. Seasoned with sherry wine for, and, and, and our people said two years. I know some that will do it for 18 months. Yeah, exactly. People will do it for two years. Um, what's important here is that it's not the sherry that's subsequently going to be served on your your table with Christmas dinner. This is uh, undrinkable. And, and what happens is they'll let that sherry sit in the cask for between 18 months and two years, and that cask will then find its way out of Jerez to be used in, in, in different alcohol industries, typically whiskey, um, and the contents of that cask will probably be the vinegar you're putting exactly. on your salad yeah. or, uh, or sauces they use it for. So it's certainly not it's, drinking. It's exactly that, yeah. So... Considering all of this that we talked about, you know, we've got, we, we were just we were talking earlier about Miza, Mizanora, the Japanese whiskey, you know, a lot of hype associated with Mizanora as an alternative oak. Really, really expensive because, as you point out, it's 200 years to grow a tree. It's, you were talking about, we were talking about knots in the wood. It's not particularly good it's not for a maturing oak. whiskey. No, it's no. not. So it's a bit of a vanity. And yeah. the other thing is that if you are, buying um, whiskies with this Mizanora tag attached to them. Um, chances are it's just a Mizanora finish, and then that Mizanora finish isn't really going to give you much idea of how a whisky will truly yeah. develop in a Mizanora cask because it just takes too long from a commercial perspective, and this obviously consumers are willing to pay the premium. So we've got this massive boom going on in our industry. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants quality whiskey all around the world. Great news for us, but we've also got these obligations to be more sustainable with our industry. We know that the cost of wood is impacting the retail price of whiskey. You know, yeah. there has to be some sort of rationalization. We can't just sort of carry on forever, sort of wood becoming rare and rare. How do we do it? it comes back to what do we call it again? Um, shave, toast, <laughs> and char. STR and and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. You know, there's always if you talk about a first fill cask, which is um, typically going to be active and, and and going through these processes with your whiskey for about ten years. Second fill will uh, probably seven years. Third fill typically five years. Um, and then you really need to. And then yeah, you need to look at rejuvenating that cask essentially. So this is really interesting because there's this idea amongst sort of the layman that uh, that you know you have to that you can't have your whiskey sat in uh, that's a bad turn of phrase but dead cask but absolutely 100% you can because one of the key things that we have to avoid is is destroying the character of the whiskey and if we if we're having a whiskey mature for an extended period of time then obviously what we don't want to be doing is is putting it in different casks and this is why finishing is uh, is a really nice sort of element to whiskey maturation production because you allow it comes back to the subtractative process you know the the, the whiskey is continuing to mature there's still this subtractative process occurring even though perhaps the wood is is again dead for the time being without going through the uh, the str process but there's still that extractive process going on so we let that happen yeah. And then when we're looking at ABVs or whether we're determining when this cask is actually going to be bottled, then we can have a look at giving it some sort of exotic finish. Exactly. And not necessarily just have it sat there in the same or, or just constantly changing the cask. And that sense they've destroyed. That, that finishing whiskey. became really popular um, kind of beginning of the 2000s. And um, Brookladdy and Benriak were two of the first ones that started essentially acing their whiskey. Um, where they were re-racking the liquid, so mm. transferring from from the original cask yeah. the whiskey into a smaller cask or into a different type of cask to give it that finishing finishing flavor. Also interesting enough, uh, distilleries like Tamnevolen, who are pre Which predominantly, to mention. Sure. you know, they they were predominantly used exactly. They were predominantly used for blending purposes, and they yeah. had all of these like millions and millions of liters sat into essentially dead casks. Now, because of the boom of single malt scotch, they're now becoming to, or they're, they're starting essentially to re-rack yeah, their old casks yeah. into these freshly rejuvenated or even first fill, second fill casks to 
then put them onto the market. And and this is a process that we've seen many times before. And there's there's one individual that uh, I, that even the sort of layman would probably be familiar with, Billy Walker. And this is exactly how he's sort of made his name for himself yeah. by taking you know distilleries that may well have been mothballed but still had some stocks out there, as you said, in cast and not particularly yeah. doing anything for the to the benefit of the whiskey, but by re-racking and acing them, just putting new life into these whiskies and giving them some character that when they get right, I mean, you know, Billy Walker stuff is yeah. incredible. Um, so, question. Are you familiar with Yalumba? With what? Yalumba. I should I'm sure you don't pronounce it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sounds like it should be said Yalumba. But Yalumba. So again, um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we are fortunate enough today, and I'm going to turn these around. I've been trying to. those of you that are watching, and maybe Billy can get you a shot there. But this is, we talk about, you know, the creation of a spirit. And, and Hervey Magnol and James, uh, father and son, the proprietors of a wonderful establishment called the Fisherman's Retreat in Bury in Lancashire. Um, they have an amazing whiskey bar there, and uh, and Hervey is um, he's an intrepid explorer, and he, he sort of fit one. He's got this amazing cask philosophy. This is what you were you were telling me about yeah. earlier. We, we yeah. we'll meet Hervey yeah. quite soon, um, but he's allowed us. As you can see, we've already tasted these, um, but it's precious liquid. Um, he's uh, he's allowed us to sort of use two of his bottles as an example of what you can do if you've really got an innovative philosophy on the way you approach the wood when you're maturing your whiskey. And uh, and again, this is a great example of how independent bottlers have been at the forefront of innovation in the whiskey industry in terms of cask use and, um, and cask finishes and just management of the wood generally. So your lumber is an Australian winery. Australian wine. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, this is Wikipedia because uh, I've never been to Australia. Um, in the Barossa Valley wine region, founded by a British brewer, actually, a guy called Samuel Smith, who emigrated to Australia with his family, some Dorset. He went down there in 1847, um, built a small house next to a river and set up a, uh, a vineyard. He purchased 30 acres of land named his property Yalumba after an indigenous Australian word for all the land around. Now, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, in 1849, Smith and his son, Sydney, planted Yalumba's first vineyards, beginning the Yalumba dynasty. And today, Yalumba is Australia's oldest family-owned winery. So why are we talking about Yalumba? Um, because Hervey went to Australia and acquired himself some casks from Yalumba, Brought them back. Should we have to, a look at one? Uh, brought them back. Well, more importantly, can we have a taste of one? So, so what, what do we actually have? So we've got. So what? 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 What his process ready. has been on these particular, and they are award-winning whiskies. I, I hasten to add, and I think um, Heavy was telling me a tale about how um, I think it was a Brook Laddick, the former Jim. Jim, former master distiller at Brook Laddick, he, he left there a few years ago, but he'd actually tasted. Um, one of um, Hervey and James's expressions from his distillery, and uh, and said that he would be more than happy to give it a gold medal. And it would appear that uh, that's exactly what's happening. He's winning an awful lot of gold. So it's a great example, as I say, of innovation in the independent bottling sector, and uh, and and the use of what is a wine cask now. We're not going to sort of do We're not going to do tasting notes. We'll, it's incredible stuff, isn't it? So this is the Aaron. This is the Aaron, yeah. yeah so. so we've got Aaron Distillery, seven years in the Yolumba, in the Yolumba cask, cask, right? It's been distilled in 2013, bottled in 2021, and this is a limited edition. Yeah, so how many bottles were there? Well, 408. I think you can still get it. Um, it's still, I think, uh, Herbie and James still have a few bottles available. But, yeah, I'm not going to get too much into that. So it's a really nice mouthfeel to it. It comes probably from the glucose in the wine. So it really sticks to the palate. 
sweet from the wine. I mean, I've not tasted the yellow wine, but straight away there's a lot of grape in there. A sweet wine. I mean, it just the point is, it just complements the whiskey so well. Now, Aaron, there's a little bit of peat there, isn't there, but we got the slightly. Brook Gladio, yeah. <laughs> we tried the Brook Gladio earlier. So. And the, 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 this thing about the peated whiskey as well, the fennels are responsible for that smoky aroma. They you do lose them over the course of time. That's again part of this extractative process. It will get rid of those fennels. So the older um, peated expression will over time. This is a fantastic so, whiskey for us. Turn it out a little bit. Um, it's the the for me the Brooklyn is a little bit like well, I've used this. It's a little bit hot for yeah. my taste. It's a little bit, but peppery. it might also you know it might point towards what we're talking about, where you know looking for a faster maturation so you can get the compounds in, get that color, but not perhaps give the whiskey the opportunity to fully complete its extract extraction part of the process which is uh, evaporation is obviously key to that and getting rid of some of these unpleasant compounds but that i wish you could taste it you know what wanted to plug james and uh, heavy too much but the fisherman's retreat if you go online he's got some wonderful selections of whiskey but more importantly you'll find some of his uh, award-winning whiskies there online and uh, and this uh, this um your lumber stuff is is really really amazing but I, I would hope that we've given some insight into the importance of wood, um, oak, very specifically, in, in the maturation of whiskey, um, how the use of oak has come about, and uh, and you know, and, and thinking about what the future might hold, um, I think it's going to, unfortunately, we're going to be increasingly impacted by the shortage of wood for the whiskey industry uh, regulations provenance obviously is really really important we're seeing that industry. now already um yeah and we're starting to see this already and and as you said you know, if we've got sustainable oak foresting programs there's going to be a while before we start to uh, to be able to harvest these things yeah um so yeah if you have an oak cast at home don't cut it in half <laughs> and fill it with dirt and flowers take it down to your local cooperage and get it shaved toasted and chart chart there you go so if you enjoyed the podcast don't forget to like and subscribe to our youtube channel or alternatively head over to spotify and give us what is it a rating or a liking just whatever it is make sure it's positive preferably thank you again <laughs>